God forming you? That is the question. And how is God shaping and forming you? That's the question, and the way I want you to answer this question is with this, a piece of clay. So back in uh, 2020, I was scheduled to attend this conference out in Denver, but on the way there, um, before, before the conference ever started, of course, 2020 happened. <laughs> so you can imagine the conference was canceled. And so I had purchased these tickets to go out to Denver, and everything in life was canceled. Um, but I thought, hey, maybe I'll go out there. Maybe there's still something I can do. I still had this, these tickets. I still had a week set aside. So I decided to fly out to Denver, and I found a monastery that was still open at the time. And it was also a retreat center right on the front range of the Rockies. So I went there, and um, what I didn't know when I first signed up, though, was that this retreat center was a silent retreat center, as in nobody talked ever. Like we would sit around at these big communal meals just staring at one another like, that's not weird at all. <laughs> uh, the only exception to uh, the speaking rule was when you met with your assigned spiritual director. You had the option to meet with a spiritual director, someone that the monastery would supply. And so I said, okay, sign me up for this. This sounds interesting. I'd heard a little bit about spiritual direction in the past. I'm like, let me try this. So uh, they, they assigned me to a spiritual director. I show up at my first session. And this woman is, um, the most gracious way I can describe it, is a blue-haired Jesus grandma. She must have been 85 years old, right? I'm like, okay, not what I was expecting, but this will be, let's try this. This could be fun. So at our first session, I show up, and I've got all these, like, you know, it's 2020, and I've, I've got all these heavy, like, psychological, spiritual, emotional, theological questions. So I walk into this session, and I just, bleh, all my difficult, brilliant questions onto the table. And she pauses for, like, an awkward amount of time. And then she's like, oh, oh, you, you know I'm not going to answer any of those, right? Let's get one thing clear. I'm not here to answer your questions. I'm not here to give you advice. I am not your therapist. I'm here to help you pay attention to God. I'm here to help you pay attention to what God is already doing, saying, working in your life. That's what spiritual direction is. I'm like, okay. So then I come to the session the next day, and we have a session. I'm kind of getting the hang of this thing. And at the end of the session, she's like, now, I have a homework assignment for you. I'm like, well, I'm at a silent retreat center, nothing else to do. Let's try it. Like, and, you know, assignments, like she say, I'm good at assignments. I'm like, give me homework. I can get an A on that thing. So she's like, I want you to meditate on Proverbs 8. And I'm like, I got this one. All right? I know this one. This is the one you might know it. Uh, it's uh, where wisdom is personified. The wisdom of God is personified as a woman crying out at the city gate, calling to all who will listen, come listen to me. And I was like, I know this one. I've studied it in Hebrew. Like I, I intimately know the early church debates between like Arian and Athanasius over this, over Proverbs 8.22. And how it really shows who Christ is. I'm familiar with the intertextuality of like Genesis 1 and Psalm 19 and Proverbs 8 and John 1 and Colossians. But I, I know this text. But then she asked me to do one more thing. She said, now, after you read this, conver this passage in conversation with God, that's how she described it, I want you to then draw a picture of what you feel God is saying to you. I don't know how that strikes you, <laughs> but at the time, I, I think uh, the word I would use to describe it is dumb. <laughs> yeah. I said, like, uh, I'm like, oh, dear, sweet Jesus lady, you want me to draw a picture of how I feel the scripture, for you? like how I feel? Like, this is, what is this? Is that how you want me to interpret the Bible? Uh, what do you want me to do next? Like, next, I want you to put on spandex, and now give us an interpretive dance of the book of Romans. <laughs> So, 
the whole thing felt woo-woo, like that type of um, emotional drivel that you go to seminary to get it ground out of you, right? But here I was, sitting across from this dear, sweet, blue-haired Jesus lady. And I literally had no one else to talk to for the whole week. So I'm like, oh, tomorrow i got to show up with something. So I was like, okay, I will do this. I sucked it up. I got over my need to have the exegetically correct interpretation. I pushed through my insecurities. It's amazing how insecure a little blue-haired lady could make me feel about drawing a picture. And I got just felt so like, ah, i got to draw a picture. And so I sat down to do it. And when I did it, something unexpected happened. In the doing, in the submitting to it, in, in the entering into my own insecurities, in humbling myself, I was able to hear the text in a way that I'd never heard it before. Something about forcing me to draw a picture allowed me to hear a woman crying out to me. And I could see the city gate in a way that I'd never seen it before. God was shouting for my attention, but I couldn't hear him until I drew the dumb picture. So the next day, I show up to our session, and I'm like, you, what kind of witchcraft is this? You're a genius. So theologians, philosophers, psychologists, they all have all kinds of technical terms for this experience that I just described. Um, we could go through the research sometime, perhaps I will, but you don't have to have a graduate degree to figure out why this kind of like indirect, super rational process might be helpful and even essential if you want to know the God who is spirit and truth. He, he, he's not an object. You can't safely study him. You can't dissect him. He's a person. You have to encounter him, and when you encounter him, it is frightening. It is fearful. It, it draws out all your insecurities. It challenges you. To truly know him relationally is more than head knowledge, and it takes courage. It's fearful. His word is not just a text. It's living and active. You have to enter into it. You have to hear it. You have to experience it. You have to, you have to, to use Paul's words, you have to walk it, and you can't possibly know it until the Spirit opens the eyes of your heart. So I don't say this to discourage systematic study of God or his word. I hope that's clear. I've devoted my life to it, okay? And I don't plan on, like, exchanging my sermons for interpretive dance anytime soon, right? As great as that might be, guys. But I would like to suggest that maybe we do well to add to our systematic study something that forces us out of our comfort zone, something that forces us into our insecurities, something that won't let us hide behind our well-built defenses, something that humbles us and allows us to hear God's word in a new way. And that brings us to this lump of clay. So today I want to invite you into something that might feel dumb, might bring out all your insecurities. Um, first, we'll start just like any normal Sunday. I'm going to preach I'm going to preach a text. It'll sound familiar to many of you. Ephesians 2, 10. And we're going to consider this question. How is God shaping and forming us? How is he shaping and forming you? And that's the easy part, or at least the comfortable part, because um, I've done this hundreds of times now. Like, I I'm pretty competent at at least analyzing a text. And, and if you've been at church, you're probably pretty competent at making it through my sermons. But the next part is where the wheels might come off. <laughs> Uh, you might find it unsafe or woo-woo or, dare I say, dumb. While I'm preaching, you're invited to talk to God about how you might answer this question with this, a piece of clay. Again, um, let me just be clear, no pressure here. This is an invitation. If you hate art class, if you just like this whole thing just feels crazy to you, seriously, just listen to the sermon. This is just another sermon. This is only an invitation, not a command. But then there's others of you who are like already like making an ashtray right now. Yeah, you know who you are? Yeah. I'm super excited about it. Uh, for you, I want to give you a special invitation. If, if, if God does give you something that you want to create that, that expresses what God is saying to you right now, then I want you to um, follow the lead on the first service. And, and you can display it up here on the front or there's tables set up in the back if you want to. Or you can take it home with you or you can give it to your kids. Whatever you want to do. Just invitation. Who knows? We might give out awards or something. So maybe, maybe this is a dumb idea. Or maybe it's genius. 
I'm going to leave that between you and God to decide. Our text for today is Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 10, but let's start with the context. Last week, Jack uh, gave us this, this 40,000 foot view of Ephesians 1 through 9. He, he described it, um, this majestic view of it, uh, like hopping into a little plane and flying into the Himalayas. And he said, you've got to first look down at the lowest of lows of the valley of sin, so that you can step back and appreciate the monumental greatness of God's love, of his grace for us in Christ. And this whole passage hinges on this one sentence that Paul takes a long, long time to say. It's, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead, but God made you alive. And then Paul gives us this explanation, two explanations actually. The first one, the first explanation to help wrap our hearts and minds around what this means for us. And the explanation is this. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And even this, it's not of yourself so that no one can boast. Then in verse 10, Paul picks up this exact same weighty theme that you've been made alive by grace. That theme, he picks that up, but he does something in classic like Hebrew style. It's called Hebrew parallelism. It's where you say the exact same thing, but you say it in such a different way that it's as if it's the first time you ever heard it. So if you listen carefully to the message today, you're going to find that the content, there's no new content added. I will add nothing new to what we said last week, but it's going to sound completely and utterly different. So on the pen of the Apostle Paul, this word grace is kind of shorthand for the unfathomable love and kindness and goodness of God that is directed towards you in Christ. Towards you in Christ. This is what we talked about last week. That's what grace is. It's God's unfathomable love, kindness, goodness directed towards you. But when God's grace then smashes into your life, when you realize Christ died for me, he loves me right now in my sin, in my brokenness, in wherever you're at, when that happens... Grace is not inert. It doesn't just bump and fall off of you. It's a power. It does something in you and to you and through you. It does something radical. When grace smashes into your heart, dead things become alive. You were dead, but God made you alive by grace. That's how that happened. So in Christ, God directed his overwhelming love, kindness, goodness toward you. But when it smashed into your soul, you were made alive. You, <gasps> like a newborn baby, you took your first breath and you were made alive. By grace, you've been saved. You are a new life. So last week, Paul described how God's grace is directed towards you. But this week, he's going to look at the same thing, except he's going to give us a picture of what happens when to that grace in you. Not just towards you, but in you. So when we ask the Apostle Paul, this question, how is God shaping and forming us? How exactly does God's grace work in us? He answers like this. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. How is God forming us? It has something to do with creation. The word handiwork and created are two different words, both referring to the creative work of God. Creation, as in like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But let's be clear here, Paul's not talking about that creation. He's talking about a new creation. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he inaugurated a new creation. He was the first of a new creation of the new heavens and earth, a, a, a new reality, a new thing that God is doing. And the new creation... This new heavens and earth will not come, not fully, until Jesus returns, and then, that, then all of that will happen. But it is already, right now, breaking out. So when that grace smashes into your heart, when you believe Jesus died for my sins, that life that breaks out in you is part of a new creation, that new life, the new creation is happening in you. When God's grace takes hold of you, that life breaks out in you. And that life is not like the life you were born with. That life cannot be taken from you. It's the life of Christ. It's the life with God that can never be taken from you. It is resurrection life. It's the life that Paul describes as, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. To say it a bit more bluntly, when God's grace smashes into your soul, 
New life begins in you. You gasp for, th for the first time. <gasps> and that life is a life of worship and repentance and surrender and sacrifice and love and joy and peace. That life that you're experiencing in part right now, but truly, is the beginning of a life that will never end. To use the Apostle John's language, it's the life of the ages. To use the Apostle Paul's language, it is the life that is truly life. That's the life you were created to live. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is the life that God is leading you into. God is forming, forming you. Everything he's doing in your life right now is to form that life for you. All your circumstances, all the hardship, all the good things, everything happening in your life, God is using that to form this life, the life of Christ in you. It is, as the Apostle Paul will later say in Ephesians 5, a life of love. And just as in the first creation, when God um, formed the man, breathed the breath of life into him, just as in the first creation, as he formed that man, he then, he then immediately took that man and he was an image bearer. He set him over his creation to do the work of God. He now represents God in the same way. In this new creation, when you receive this new life, when you are formed in Christ, you are invited immediately to join in his work to do good works as his representative. So here's where good works come in. You're saved by grace, not by works. So works do not save you. That's not how you get into a relationship with God. But once that new life breaks out in you, you are saved to do good works. That your life then breaks out. It bears the fruit of good works. So long as your life is rooted in Christ, is rooted in love, to quote the Apostle Paul. Now, I've just given you the entire verse, the entire sermon. I could leave it here, but I'd rather not waste all this clay. So now we're going to chat for the rest of the sermon about really just one phrase, one image that Paul gives us in this. It's five reflections on the picture of this word, for we are God's workmanship or handiwork. The Greek word is poiema. It's translated variously. It's translated workmanship, craftsmanship. If you pull out like five different translations, you'll find five different words used. Workmanship, craftsmanship, artistry. Some actually use the word masterpiece, for you are God's masterpiece. Poema gives us a sense, though it's etymologically created to the word poem or poetry in English. In the same way that a poet would take words and fashion them together into a beautiful self-expression, God is doing that through us, through you, through your life. Personally, I do not um, love the word handiwork for this, and I think it has something to do with my daughter used to watch endlessly those five-minute craft videos on kids' YouTube, and I'm just imagining, like, God the Father up there in heaven with, like, a hot glue gun and popsicle sticks. <laughs> Nothing against crafting. It's just not the image that works for me. I prefer the word workmanship, for we are God's workmanship, but don't get hung up on the particular word here. Get hung up on the image. It's the same word used of Isaiah in Isaiah 29, 16, to describe a potter forming the clay. He's the potter, you are the clay. That's the image. It's, it's Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. How have they been seen? From what has been made, poema by his workmanship, by his craftsmanship. That's how you know God. You see it. You see his handiwork everywhere. That the work itself reveals the workmanship. That it says something about the one who made it. This image gives us some sense of who this God is and how he works in us. So we're going to talk about this word for just a minute, though, to get, get a little bit of context because this word workmanship has kind of lost something over the years. Um, I don't know about you, but workmanship seems to be increasingly foreign rare, maybe just a luxury or something. Our concept of fine craftsmanship tends to look like, um, I actually put together my own Billy bookcases from Ikea. Craftsmanship. Yeah, yeah. Uh. So the Apostle Paul lived in a pre-Ikea day. Um, there were no cheap mass-produced goods from China. Everything was handmade. He himself was a tent maker. Remember? Tent maker. So a few years ago, we got to go, Jenny and I got to go to ancient Corinth, and you can go down to the city street, and there's the ancient Agora, the, and then right around the corner are the stalls, the original stalls, some of them still standing, where the, the artisans, the craftsmen, 
the, the woodworkers, the leather workers, the tent makers would have lived and worked, lived and worked those stalls. We, we think the Apostle Paul lived right on that street somewhere for at least 18 months of his life. So he literally, he was a, a workman. Uh, he was a craftsman. He was an artist, and, and he lived among this. He literally lived and breathed poema. He was surrounded by these people. This is his world. And this brings me to my first observation about this word, about this image that God gives us. And it's this, the workmanship that Paul speaks of. Workmanship connotes a different quality of work. It's not just a different type of product. It comes from a different place, a different motivation. It's a different way of working. It's a different way of being in the world. So, um, so in an assembly line production, like mass production, you likely have no personal connection with the product you're making. Like, you're just supposed to do what they tell you to do. Like, the job is a means to an end. You do the job so that you make the money, and the product itself is a means to an end. So you just keep stitching, keep stitching, keep stitching the same stitch over and over and over again so that they can, some American can hop online and be like, ooh, Primark, check this out. There's a Santa sweater that I can get for $12. Now, it'll completely degrade as soon as you wash it once, but who cares? It's only $12. You can buy one next week. It's awesome. That's what I'm aware of. So a Santa sweater for Primark, that is the disposable end product. That's why you're working, right? You're wor if the company could replace you with a cheaper, faster, more efficient, more precise electronic version of you, they would. You are not necessary. You're not even wanted. It, like, they don't ask you, will you put yourself into this product? Get creative. No, they don't, that's the last thing they want. They want you to produce the exact same thing over and over and over as efficiently as they can. The person getting the shirt has no connection to you or to the shirt. When, the, when it gets old, when it gets out of style, they're going to pitch it in the trash and they'll get a new one for next season. Now, there are obvious benefits to this world or we wouldn't live in it. Like, who here doesn't love Old Navy, right? <laughs> Primark, Costco, Target. I mean, this is, so do you know that you can get 350 pieces of moldable clay in less than two days on Amazon? <laughs> God bless America, right? This is amazing. I mean, it's great, but there is a downside. The problem comes in when we, we, this moves from just a way of shopping to a way of living to a way of being. In our day, in our world, everything, I'm not just talking sweatshops and assembly lines, I'm talking everything is becoming disposable, a means to an end. So education, marriage, children, church, vocation. People are giving their whole lives as a means to an end. This, this is not workmanship. Workmanship connotes a different quality of work. It's a different way of being. It comes from a different place, a different motivation. So a friend of mine right now is working on um, gathering reclaimed wood to build a, a big table, big lavish table of some sorts. Now, does the man need a table? No, he's got a table. Could he go to Restoration Hardware and probably buy a better looking table than the one he's going to build? Probably. But, but that's not the point. There's something, something creative, something longing to reflect the, the creativity of our creator that is within him. That he will spend hours searching for reclaimed wood. Hours working that wood, overlaying, thinking through every bit and piece, planning and working and reworking every piece. He might spend more on tools than him with the table. Why? Because he loves it. Because it expresses something deep within him. Because it's beautiful. And beauty does not need a reason. Workmanship. That's what workmanship is. So, have you ever wondered... If God really wants me to become like Jesus, he wants me to be whole and healthy, and he wants me to be without sin. If that's what he really wants, why, why? Why is it taking so long? What's with all this process? What's with all this pain? What's with all this learning slowly on and on? What's with all this painful process that God takes us through? What's with this slow 
drawn out thing called sanctification. And the Apostle Paul answers, for we are God's workmanship. Do you hear that? He's not just looking for the end result. He's a craftsman. He, if he just wanted a perfect version of you, then he would have created that. But the work itself matters. The process itself matters. He is in the process. He's driven by a different motivation. And we don't have to search for what God's motivation in this whole thing is. It tells us, verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God. That's the image. God is a craftsman who loves you, who finds beauty in working with you right now as you are you are not just a means to an end. God loves you. He loves the journey you are on right now. He loves the process. He loves the discovery. If you want to find God, he's in the process. Number two, workmanship implies vision. So workmanship doesn't just come from a different place. It, it points us to a different place. It leads to a different end. Workmanship implies, in fact, it demands a vision, an aim, a Telos, if you know that word. So um, my favorite example of this is probably um, Michelangelo. You, uh, surely you know, the Renaissance artist. He's probably most famous for the Sistine Chapel painting that. But b long before he was a painter, he was a sculptor. But by the age of 30, he had done two world-famous masterpieces, the, the David and the Pieta. My favorite is the Pieta. Uh, right as you enter into St. Peter's Basilica on the right-hand side in Rome, this, you see this. It's stunning. That out of, a, out of a block of marble, he has done something that is so emotive, so beautiful, so flowing, so intimate, that he, it comes to life out of a block of marble. There's a famous line in one of his early biographies by, I believe it was by Vasari. So during his lifetime, there's this biography written of him, and it describes this conversation he had where someone said, how do you do that? How do you make something like that, something so alive, something so beautiful, emerge from just a block of marble? And his answer, famously, is the sculpture is already complete within the marble before I start my work. It is already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. So if you go to the academy in Florence, you can, you can see an example of this. As you enter into, to see the David, you know, the big naked guy, you know? As you go in there, on the sides are these uh, unfinished sculptures of Michelangelo. And if you look at them, they literally look like these figures bursting out of the rock. It's like, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's as though he could just see into the rock this figure, and he's just pulling it away, pulling it away. And this, this is workmanship. The chef, the woodworker, the weaver, the poet, the sculptor, they have to have a vision for what they are forming Without vision, one might think that the sculptor's just breaking up marble, just smashing it, just destructive, just purposeless. But once you catch a vision of what, what the sculptor sees, what the artist sees, what the craftsman sees, then suddenly this destruction, this dust, this, this pain, this chiseling becomes something beautiful. Something beautiful begins to emerge. And we catch a glimpse of God's vision for us in this very verse. For we are God's workmanship, his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. He has this vision of our life. He sees us. He sees the good works flowing out of us. He sees love and hope. He doesn't see anxiety. He doesn't see the brokenness. He sees what he's going to use those things to build and create in us. He sees the opportunities he's going to place in front of us and how he's using what's happening right now, breaking apart your life, that he's pulling it away to create something beautiful something that is glorious to God and good for you. The joy, the pain, the hardship, the opportunities, none of these are accidental. None of these are just destructive. Each one is a breaking away of the master sculptor. <laughs> he works all things together for the good of those who love him and been called according to his purpose. Number three, workmanship knows and respects the nature of that with which it works. So there's, there's a couple at our church who specializes in gourmet pizzas. To call them gourmet pizzas seems insufficient. Um, pizza art. <laughs> That's what they do, pizza art. It's, um, it, it's, it's insane. Like I, we, Jenny and I have got to experience it a number of times. And if you go to their house and witness it, it is, 
it is craftsmanship in its true form. And here's the thing about it. Um, they know pizza in a way that I didn't know was possible. Like, I'm like, no, you take it out of the, the freezer and you pop it in the oven. <laughs> no, they, they know where, um, they know the, the age of the cheese. They know where the wheat was grown. Like, the, the exact farm where it was grown. They know the consistency that it's ground to and exactly the, the percentage of water that you add to it and how long you let it rise. They know everything about this. It's stunning. They know the ingredients. Woodworkers, they don't know just the types of wood, but they know every single piece of wood. Where every knot is, they know every single piece of wood. Poets, they, they know and deeply, deeply respect words. They know how they sound and feel and roll in the mouth. They know how the anticipation and the aftertaste of a good turn of phrase. So, so craftsmen, artists, they intimately know and respect things like wheat, wor- wood, and words. Here's the question. How much more so when you're working with people? Tell me, parents, if you have more than, more than one child, can you treat every child the same and expect the same results? <laughs> Not if you have teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. She's like, oh, wait, what, what just happened? Um, yeah, you cannot mass produce people. If, if you expect that, you don't understand what you're working with. And here's the thing. God is a master artist. He works with a deep and intimate knowledge and respect of you. Psalm 139. You've searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. He knows what you're thinking. You discern my goings out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. You, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. God knows you better than you know you. He knows why you do what you do when you don't know why you do what you do. And from this knowledge, from this respect of you, of your nature, of of who you are and where you came from and how you're created, he then takes that and he works with you so that you may flourish. There's a line in the message, which is a uh, paraphrase of the Bible, and it's um, paraphrasing that great invitation that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 11. It's it's just beautiful. That, That come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. But then the second half of it reads like this in the message. He's paraphrased like this. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. And that's it. God's not trying to force you into a mold. He's not trying to lay something heavy on you. He's not trying to make you into something that you're not supposed to be. He's actually trying to pull away all the false things, all the things that are stopping you from becoming who you're created to be, who you could be, his vision of you. Do you understand? He knows you better than you know you. His laws, his goals, his his discipline in your life is not to crush you or change you or misform you. It's to free you. It's to allow you to be who you're created to be because he knows you and respects you more than you know and respect yourself. Number four, God's workmanship is God's, not yours. Or to put it another way, your life is God-made, not self-made. So the Apostle Paul will make, if anything of these observations, this is the most obvious from this passage. Paul will make this contrast explicit in the next verse. In verse 11, he refers, he talks about the Jews the Jews who refer to themselves as the circumcision, which is done by, um, not done by God, but by human hands. So in verse 10, he says, for we are God's workmanship. And then in verse 11, he talks about the Jews who are circumcised, which is done by human hands. So in the Old Testament, God gave the, the Jewish people through Abraham the sign of circumcision as a sign of covenant or relationship with them. It was a sign of grace. It was a sign of relationship that you did nothing, but God came after you and loved you. So this sign that you were invited into a relationship with God. But then they took this sign of grace and they turned it into a work. They turned it into something they could boast about. Hey, I'm better than you. God loves me more than you. I'm great because I have circumcision and you don't. 
They turned it into a self-designation. They found their life not in the grace of God, but in their self-designation, their self-proclaimed superiority over those poor, ungodly, uncircumcised people. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine someone who's religious, who thinks they're better than other people, who actually uses their religion to judge other people? Can you imagine that God would so love some people that he would give them his word and give them his church and give them one another in, in, in a family and then they would go out and hate everyone else and judge everyone else? Can you imagine such a thing? So the Apostle Paul, he says this, what the Jews are doing. This is not God's workmanship. This is done by human hands. God didn't birth this life in you. This is self-made, human-made, contrived, artificial, false. And, and he pulls this phrase, done by human hands. He pulls it straight out of the Old Testament. You know where this is used? To describe idols. So do you hear the contrast here? He says that there is a life that is God-made. We are God's workmanship, and it is by grace, and it leads to love and joy, and peace, and patience in the life of Jesus. God is forming you into this life the way a potter would form clay, and it's intentional and careful and personal. It doesn't ruin you. It doesn't change who you are. It makes you, sets you free, allows you to be who you're truly called to be. But then there's a second option. There's a self-made life, a life that we all are tempted to make for ourselves, a life that is about money and about careers and about religion and about politics a life that you, you can make it about whatever you want, sports, all these things. And, and here's the thing. We, we all know, like, none of these things are bad in and of themselves. But you can take these things and say, well, I'm part of this party, or I have this money, so I have this education, so I'm better than you, so we separate ourselves. Or you can attach yourself to it. Like, I root for the eagles, and they're undefeated, so I'm better than you. <laughs> Right? You can use these things to separate ourselves. Now, there's nothing wrong with careers or schools or kids or even the eagles. I don't know about that one, but we'll see. But when you take a good thing and you make it your life, it's called idolatry. It's called idolatry. And the result of that life is contrived, artificial, false, depersonalizing, doomed to collapse, doomed to damnation is the word because it's based on a fiction it, it, it's not real god never said that existed you you made that up it's human made god's workmanship is god's not yours and the last but not least god's workmanship does not erase you it makes you into a new creation so what kind of creation is God forming you into? Um, it's a new creation. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're not exactly sure what that means. I mean, we have some, some pictures of it in the scriptures, but words tend to fail. Like uh, the Apostle Paul gives us this great chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 where he describes it with these words. He says, this new life that he's building, putting in you, that he's creating in you, that he's going to change the whole world with, it is imperishable, and it is glorious, and it is powerful, and it is spiritual. Those are the words he uses. That someday we will be whole and complete. The word is a uh, Hebrew word. It's shalom. We will know that. We'll be with God in a way that we simply cannot know fully this side of resurrection that much we know but we also know this that whatever that new life is like that new creation is like god is not starting from scratch he's not erasing the past so god is not erasing you he's not erasing this earth he's not erasing your past he's recreating it the way he recreated jesus so when jesus died he was buried, and then when he rose from the dead, he, he didn't just come back to life. He was, he was transformed. He was made glorious. He was resurrected. So Jesus is the first of this new creation. And, and Jesus, his, what we read about him in the scriptures, this tells us something about this new creation. So this imperishable, glorious, powerful, glorious, spiritual, resurrected Jesus is all of that, but he's also not so different than the Jesus prior to that. I mean, if you read the passages, he's still like eating fish. He, he breathes. <gasps> Which is to say, he's still a human. 
He's fully human. So, so resurrection, this glorious thing that God wants to do with you and through you, is not different than humanity. It's the completion of humanity. In fact, the most shocking part of all of this is that Jesus still bears the scars. Have you ever considered this? He still bears the marks of the cross. Like He's resurrected. He's perfected. He's glorious. He's fully who God called him to be. He is awesome and whole and complete and holy, but he still bears the marks of the cross. God does not erase the past. He doesn't pretend like it never happened. He doesn't get rid of the scars. He recreates them. So he takes these marks of violence and hatred and brokenness and sin. And he makes those into marks of peace and love and grace and holiness. So last week, um, the artist, let's see if I can get his name right. It's Makoto Fujimura. I was first uh, introduced to him maybe 15, 20 years ago. He's really fascinating because he's a visual artist, Japanese, as you might guess from his name. Uh, because he was doing work that I'd never heard of an artist doing, trying to visualize, like show you, allow you to experience the gospel through visual art. I was like, this is stunning stuff. He just won an award, popped up in my newsfeed because it's um, a famous theological award that I follow. And he won his award for his art called Kintsugi. Kintsugi. I had to get trained on how to say this. Kintsugi is um, a Japanese, it's a, it's a combo word. The first part means gold, kin, and sugi means to mend together, but it also means to, to bind together family generations. It means both those, and kintsugi brings all of that together. Um, it's taking broken pottery pieces, but not just pottery, um, ceremonial like teacups, treasured vases, family heirlooms that have been passed down from generation to generation. Once they have family history to them, but they're broken. And then the artist, the kintsugi artist, will take them and it'll bind back the broken pieces together using gold to form something that is stunningly beautiful. So in Japanese tradition, restoring the original pieces is actually better than replacing it. That the mended bowl now is considered more valuable than the original. It now bears the marks of the family. It bears a family history. It is made more beautiful because it's been broken and then mended. So Fujimura explains that in Kintsugi, the artist doesn't try to hide or erase the imperfections. Rather, they, they in some ways highlight them. They emphasize them because those are the marks of grace. Fujimura suggests this is a picture of resurrection. That this is what God wants to do in us. That he's not here to erase your brokenness or deny it. But somehow he's going to piece together the brokenness in your life. In a way that is more beautiful than you can imagine. Will actually make you more valuable, not less valuable. More precious. That will bear in your body the marks of his grace. The same way Christ bears the marks of grace in his body. I think Fujimura is on to something. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So how is God shaping and informing you? If you're sitting there right now thinking, Paul, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, how am I going to fix what's broken in me? How is this going to serve me this week when I'm facing very real, real problems? Oh, you wanted me to answer? Uh, let's get one thing clear. I'm not here to give you advice. Uh, I'm not here to answer your questions. I am not your therapist. I'm just here to help you pay attention to God. Father, pray, Lord, that you would form us and that we would give ourselves into your loving hands God, I pray especially for those right now who feel broken, 
who feel like you're chiseling away at their life, Lord, I pray that they would receive every moment from you. God, I pray that you would prepare us for the good works that you have for us today, that we would receive this day and receive this week as you prepared it for us, that we would see through this lens, that we would see your goodness, that we would not just see your grace as something external to us, towards us, but we would experience your grace in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.